Chapter 1, Managerial Accounting and the Business Environment. This chapter describes the large business environment within which management accounting operates. It is divided into nine sections. Management accounting and globalization, strategy, organizational structure, process management, the importance of ethics in business, corporate governance, enterprise risk management, corporate social responsibility and sustainability reporting, and the ninth is the professional qualifications of management accountants. Management accounting is one of the core functions of businesses to help plan, evaluate, and control businesses. It relates to the provision of appropriate information for decision making. It is critical that management accounting information is prepared, provided, and used on a timely basis. Late information is of no is no information. It is important for management accounting information to be relevant, and such relevant information needs to be obtained efficiently and effectively. Cost-benefit evaluation is a key concept in management accounting. Cost accounting defines costs and evaluates inventories to help managers to run businesses. It intertwines with management accounting, and the terms are sometimes interchangeable. With the fast-changing globalized economy, management accounting plays an important role in supporting management to make quick and relevant decisions. Here we see a chart showing the world merchandise trade volume data. And it shows an enormous increase in trade throughout the world, especially during the period 1950 to 2009. And this highlights the growth of the manufacturing sector. Here we see the regional shares and world merchandise exports. And that shows that Europe and Asia have the majority shares, totaling 70% of the world merchandise exports. European companies consistently form the strongest foundation of the Fortune Global 500 and total about 184 companies in 2010. From 2005 to 2010, among the Fortune Global 500 companies, China companies increased almost threefold from 16 to 46. It's a gain of, 40, of 30 companies. Whereas Ameri American U.S. companies reduced from 176 to 139. This is a drop of 37 companies. In the second half of 2010, China officially overtook Japan as the second biggest economy in the world, reflecting the growing power of China companies. The number of Fortune 500 <clears throat> global firms from Taiwan and India trails closely behind South Korea were comparable with Australia forming another powerful group in the Asia Pacific region. Asian and China Chinese companies not only increase in the total numbers on the Fortune Global 500 list, but they're also taking more top spots. Four out of ten companies in 2010 were from Asia. There were only two Asian companies on the top ten in 20, 2009. One was from China and one was from Japan. So together with the earlier slide, we see that data shows the important contribution of Asian companies to the world economy. The Internet fuels globalization by providing companies with greater access to geographically dispersed customers, employees, and suppliers. While the number of Internet users continues to grow, as of June 2010, about 71% of the world's population is still not connected to the Internet. So this suggests that the Internet's impact on the business world has yet to be fully developed. So a strategy is a game plan that enables a company to attract customers by distinguishing itself from competitors. A 
Companies that adopt a customer intimacy strategy strive to understand and respond to individual customer needs better than competitors. Examples of companies that pursue this strategy include the Ritz-Carlton, Nordstrom, and Starbucks. Companies that adopt an operational excellence strategy strive to, de to deliver products and services faster, more conveniently, and at a lower price than competitors. Examples of companies that pursue this type of strategy include Daiso, Southwest Airlines, Walmart, and the Vanguard Group. Then, part three, companies that adopt a product leadership strategy to strive to offer higher quality products than competitors. Examples of these types of companies include Louis Vuitton, BMW, Cisco Systems, and W.L. Gore. So let's turn to learning objective number one. And that is to understand the role of the management accountants in an organization. Decentralization is the delegation of decision-making authority throughout an organization by giving managers the authority to make decisions relating to their area of responsibility. An organization chart shows how responsibility is divided among managers and it shows formal lines of reporting and communication. An organization chart also shows line and staff positions in an organization. A person in a line position is directly involved in achieving the basic objectives of the organization. A person in a staff position is indirectly involved in achieving those basic objectives. Staff positions support line positions, but they do not have direct authority over line positions. The Chief Financial Officer, also referred to as the CFO, is the member of top management team who is responsible for providing timely and relevant data to support planning and controlling activities and for preparing financial statements for external users. So learning objective number two, let's understand the basic concepts underlying lean production, the theory of constraints, and Six Sigma. A business process is a series of steps that are followed in order to carry out some task in a business. A value chain consists of the major business functions that add value to a company's products and services. Next, we will discuss three different approaches to improving business processes. Lean production, the theory of constraints, and Six Sigma. In a traditional manufacturing company, work is pushed through the system in order to produce as much as possible and to keep everyone busy, even if products cannot be immediately sold. The push approach almost inevitably results in large inventories of raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Raw materials are the materials that are used to make a product. Work in process inventories consist of units of product that are only partially complete and will require further work before they are ready for sale to the customer. <clears throat> Finished goods consist of units of product that have been completed but not yet been sold to customers. <clears throat> the lean thinking model is a five-step management approach that organizes resources such as people and machines around the flow of business processes that pulls units through these processes 
in response to customer orders. The first step is to identify the value to customers in specific products and services. The second step is to identify the business process that delivers this value to customers. The linked steps that comprise a business process typically span the departmental boundaries that are specified in an organization chart. The third step is to organize work arrangements around the flow of the business process. This is often accomplished by creating what is known as a manufacturing cell. The fourth step is to create a pull system where production is not initiated until a customer has ordered a product. This facet of the lean thinking model is often called just-in-time production, or JIT for short. The fifth step is to continuously pursue perfection in the business process. The result of this five-step process is to lower inventories, decrease defects, reduce wasted effort, and shorten customer response times. The lean thinking model can also be used to improve the business processes that link companies together. The term supply chain management is commonly used to refer to the coordination of business processes across companies to better serve and consumers. A constraint, <clears throat> which is also called a bottleneck, is anything that prevents you from getting more of what you want. The constraint is a system in the system is determined by the step that has the least capacity. So the theory of constraints is based on the insight that effectively managing the constraint is the key to success. The goal is to manage the constraint with the intent of generating more business rather than cutting the workforce. The theory of constraints approach to process improvement involves four steps. Identify the weakest link in the chain, which is the constraint. Second, do not place a greater strain on the system than the weakest link can handle, because if you do, the chain will break. Third, concentrate improvement efforts on strengthening the weakest link. Fourth, if the improvement efforts are successful, the weakest link will improve to the point that is no longer the weakest link. At this point, a new weakest link must be identified and the improvement process starts all over again. Six Sigma is a process improvement method that relies on customer feedback and fact-based data gathering and analysis techniques to drive process improvement. The term Six Sigma refers to a process that generates no more than 3.4 defects per million opportunities. Because this rate of defects is so low, Six Sigma is sometimes associated with the term zero defects. The DMI, DMAIC framework has five steps. D is define, M is measure, A is analyze, I is improve, and C is control. The define stage identifies the scope and purpose of the project, the flow of the current process, and the customer's requirements. The measure stage gathers baseline performance data concerning the existing process and narrows the scope of the project to the most important problems. <clears throat> the analyze stage identifies the root causes of the problems that were identified during the measure stage. The analyze stage often reveals non-value-added activities that should be eliminated wherever possible. And the improve stage is where potential solutions are developed, evaluated, and implemented to eliminate non-value-added activities and any other problems uncovered in the analyze stage. Finally, the control stage ensures that problems remain fixed and that new methods are improved over time. 
So let's move to learning objective number three, which is to understand the importance of upholding ethical standards. The Institute of Management Accountants Statement of Ethical Professional Practice consists of two parts, guidelines for ethical behavior and guidelines for resolution of an ethical conflict. Management accountants have responsibility for ethical behavior in four broad areas. The first area is a professional competence. Management accountants must maintain professional competence, follow applicable laws, regulations, and standards, provide accurate, clear, concise, and timely decision support information, recognize and communicate professional limitations that preclude responsible judgment. The second area is confidentiality. Management accountants must not disclose confidential information unless legally obligated to do so. Ensure that subordinates do not disclose confidential information. Not use confidential information for unethical or illegal advantage. The third area is integrity. Management accountants must mitigate conflicts of interest and advise others of potential conflicts, refrain from conduct that would prejudice carrying out duties ethically, abstain from activities that might discredit the profession. The fourth area is credibility. Management accountants must communicate information fairly and objectively Disclose all relevant information that could influence a user's understanding of reports and recommendations. Disclose delays or deficiencies in information timeliness, processing, or internal controls. When faced with an ethical conflict, the employer's established policies for conflict resolution should be followed. If a conflict cannot be resolved within the established policies, a management account should discuss the conflict with immediate superior or next highest uninvolved manager. If immediate super supervisor is the CEO, <clears throat> consider discussing the conflict with the board of directors or the audit committee. Remember that contact with levels above the immediate supervisor should only be initiated with the supervisor's knowledge, assuming the supervisor is not involved. Additional guidelines for an unresolved ethical conflict are, except for legally prescribed, communication with individuals not employed by the organization is not appropriate. Clarify relevant ethical issues with an objective advisor as a member of the IMA's ethical ethics consulting counseling service. And third, consult an attorney regarding your legal obligations. Ethical standards are motivate, motivated by very practical consideration. If the standards are not followed in business, then the economy and all of us would suffer. Abandoning ethical standards would lead to a lower standard of living with lower quality goods and services, less to choose from, and higher prices. In short, ethical standards are essential for the smooth functioning of an advanced market economy. Many companies have a formal code of conduct. These codes are generally broad-based statements of a company's responsibilities to its employees, its customers, its suppliers, and the communities in which the company operates. A code of ethics for professional accountants issued by the International Federation of Accountants, IAFPC, governs the activities of all professional accountants throughout the world in addition to outlying ethical requirements and matters dealing with integrity and objectivity, resolution of ethical conflicts, confidence, confidentiality. The IFAX code also outlines the accountant's ethical responsibilities in matters relating to taxes, independence, fees and commissions, advertising and solicitation, handling of monies, and cross-border activities. 
Corporate governance is the system by which a company is directed and controlled. If properly implemented, the corporate governance system should provide incentives for the board of directors and top management to pursue objectives that are in the interest of the company's owners, and it should provide for effective monitoring of performance. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 was intended to protect the interests of those who invest in publicly traded companies by improving the reliability and accuracy of corporate financial reports and disclosures. Six key aspects of legislation include the following. The Act requires both the CEO and CFO to certify in writing that their company's financial statements and disclosures fairly represent the results of operations. The Act establishes the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board to provide additional oversight for the audit profession. The Act places the power to hire, compensate, and terminate public accounting firms in the hands of the Audit Committee. The Act places restrictions on audit firms, such as prohibiting public accounting firms from providing a variety of non-audit services to an audit client. The Act requires a public company's independent auditor to issue an opinion on the effectiveness of the company's internal control over financial reporting. The Act establishes severe penalties for certain behaviors, such as up to 20 years in prison for altering or destroying any documents or 10 years in prison for retaliating against a whistleblower. Enterprise risk management is a process used by a company to proactively identify the risks that it faces and, and manage those risks. <clears throat> Once a company identifies its risks, Perhaps the most common risk management tactic is to reduce risks by implementing specific controls. This slide shows a subset of the business risks and controls shown in the textbook, Managerial Accounting. Collectively, these examples illustrate the diversity of risks that companies can face. For example, products harming customers, losing market share, poor weather conditions, malfunction of a website, supplier strikes, financial statements unfairly reporting the value of inventory, employee accessing unauthorized information. Corporate social responsibility, CSR, is a concept whereby organizations consider the needs of all stakeholders when making decisions. CSR extends beyond legal compliance to include voluntary actions that satisfy stakeholder expectations. <clears throat> stakeholders include groups such as customers, employees, suppliers, communities, state stockholders, environmental and human rights advocates, So here we see examples of corporate social responsibilities that are the interest to the six stakeholder groups just mentioned. GRI and IFAC play an important role in promoting sustainability reporting. The triple bottom line concept is critical to the long-term sustainability of business. European companies led the pack in sustainability reporting, followed closely by Asian companies. The growing trend of adopting GRI sustainability reporting standards is encouraging. It increased from 10 companies way back in 1999 to 1,700 companies in 2010. <clears throat> A management accountant who has the necessary qualifications and who passes a rigorous 
professional exam earns the right to be known as a certified management accountant or CMA or chartered management accountant or other management accountants qualifications depends on the country. Management accountants who become professionally qualified accountants are often given greater responsibilities and higher compensation than other management accountants who are professionally qualified. 